All right. Hello and welcome to Live from the Lab. Uh, this is a show where we look at different technologies that Brooker has developed in order to help scientists discover and research the world around us. Um, so, season today, finale. Yeah. Season yeah. finale time. So, after this, uh, we are going to take a little break, and then we're going to come back for season two. Hopefully yeah. some exciting changes there. With our shiny Emmys. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that that's over, and I, I don't think we were nominated even, so yeah. unfortunately. But today's topic is um, energy discrimination. So we're looking at um, detectors for X-ray diffraction and this new thing. I mean, I say new, yeah. but we've had an energy discriminating detector for quite a while, yeah. right? It's so, all relative, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, detector technology has evolved it quite has. a bit over time. Yeah. Um, I mean, all the way in the beginning, we had like film. Yeah, like photographic film. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But I mean, even even in our lifetimes, I mean, you know, in my career, I started out with a, a scintillation counter, like that 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 old soda can looking thing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I think maybe it's time to start drawing some pictures. <laughs> yeah, I think we have props for this. Always, always props, right? Here we go. Okay. All right. Okay. I don't I'm know if test I'm test out the art skills. All right, I haven't had to do this since uh, since grad school. You know. That's right. Chalk talk, chalk talk. A combination right. of digital and analog, <laughs> kind of like detectors. All right, I have a, I have a, I have a this is not a Sharpie. You All can right. have that one. So um, a scintillation counter, right? So kind of looks like this. Yep, big old soda can. Right. Yeah, it goes on the okay. back side. Yeah. And then in the front, there's what? That would be a crystal, right? Yeah, so there's a, um, a scintillator cr crystal. Okay. Right, so um, what a scintillator does is, is uh, as you're coming in, you know, you'd hit your x-ray, and then um, it would interact with the scintillator, and it would create um, you know, a, a little burst of light. That's right. right. And then in the back, we have a special device, oftentimes kind of drawn like this, uh, very analog, and it's called a photomultiplier tube. Right. So it does exactly what you would expect it to do. It multiplies, it multiplies the signal, right? That's so right. x-ray comes in. Spark of light, right? Bounce, 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 bounce. And then out through an analog cable to some sort of a board. Yeah. And that's going to read it out using what's called a pulse height analyzer. Right. And because of the fact that we're using a scintillator, because of the fact we then have to amplify, because of the fact that we have a cable subject to noise, not so good for energy resolution, right? Yeah. yeah. You, you see everything, right? Yeah. I always like to think about it in terms of things like, um, you know, when you go to the eye doctor, yeah. right, and they like dilate your eyes, and then suddenly you, it's like, I can see, I can see sound. Right? That's right. That's <laughs> it was right. just like overwhelming. And so like with this, anything that comes in, if it's, if it's your x-ray from your tube, if it's things like sample fluorescence, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, yep. um, you know, it just sort of floods in. So you, the good news is you get a lot of counts, but they're not always useful counts. That's right. right? Yep. And, and in this day, we used to, so you'd have one big opening, right? Yeah. And so we'd have to rely on analog things right. in order to condition that signal, right? Exactly. So to cut it to a smaller area, you would simply put a little slit right here. So there would be a, a slit right in front of it that would define the, the aperture. That's right. right. And that slit, what size would we typically use? Um, typically, I would use, say, like a 0.3 millimeter. You yep. could go down to about 100 microns. Um, but because this is one, one opening, we would call this a 0D detector. So this whole active area is just one one point, so one data point. So one point on right. the spectrum. So it would be very, very low in intensity. Um, just kind of like if you squint your eyes, yep. right? Like you you don't get a lot of light through. So like if you have a slit right in front of your detector, which would define the size of your 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 opening, um, you wouldn't get a lot of X-rays. You wouldn't get a lot of counts. So desp despite the fact that you're seeing everything, you've you've really reduced the signal that you're getting just physically by constraining the size of this opening. So now what if you had a sample though that was fluorescent? What, what could you do about it? Um, so historically, uh, the way that we handled it 20 years ago was uh, we had a, uh, they called it a secondary graphite monochromator, which would be just a little curved crystal right here. And um, it would have an acceptance angle. So as the x-rays came in, you would tilt this sort of down a little bit. It would bounce off of this and then come back into your detector. So um, again, you're throwing out a lot of intensity with that that secondary monochromator because it has yet another condition that needs to be fulfilled. So um, I think that number was about seventy to eighty percent loss. Right. Is right. What you'd be looking at with those so, graphite. So I mean, I guess to give a frame of reference, uh, when we had our older system, I mean, twenty some odd years ago, uh, it was an hour. It was an hour to take data that would be useful at all, just to say, like, does it diffract? What's yeah. what's in this? Like, basic base ID. 
And if you wanted to publish, or if you wanted something for a poster or a paper or something like that, um, or a conference, you would either take the whole afternoon, you would take an overnight slot, um, or you would bribe someone to give you like the single weekend slot. Yeah. Um, and you would run the whole system for 48 hours, you know, from Friday night all the way to through to like Monday morning. Yeah. And you just cross your fingers that no one opened the door, or, like yep. took your sample yep. off, right? Yeah. So um, now this is kind of what you did. And sometimes people then would also limit their analysis just to very narrow regions. Yeah. So there's some methods like respirable silica. It's like a you, degree. You just measure a peak. Yeah, one, one peak. One peak, and uh, you base all of your conclusions on that because you had to use that graphite monochromator, reduce the signal, and you're looking for very, very tiny signals, yeah. too. Modern so, detectors, though. Modern detectors. Modern detectors. So let's, let's right. fast forward now okay, so to we're the gonna, future. Yeah, we're going to erase this, and I'm going to try to Aggressive. Do, yeah, it's... <laughs> haven't, haven't quite been working out enough <laughs> in quarantine. All right. So the, okay. kind of this, I would call it the... Uh, Current state of the art, or the current um, standard yes. detector is silicon strip. Silicon detectors. strip. Silicon strip detectors. Okay. Sometimes I'll call them a SSD. Yeah. Okay. Silicon, so silicon strip, strip detector, detector is going to be. Well, maybe make this a little bit bigger. Okay. So you have like a little box, right? And on the front of this is going to be your silicon chip, right? And that silicon chip is going to have a bunch of different strips, right? So if we look at the actual chip face, it's going to have a bunch of strips. Now, conveniently. The size of this is optimized around the same size that we would have seen like the scintillation counter. Yeah. So um, in about our case, what, like 14 or 15, 16 millimeters. Oh, for the total thing, right. Yeah. And each individual strip is going to be uh, about 75 microns. OK. So we'll talk about that special number, 75 microns. Yeah, here. that seems very particular. It is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're being very discriminating about the size of our, of yeah. our strips here. Right? OK. So um, why silicon? So silicon is a semiconductor, okay. right? And so instead of using a scintillator, which would then have you know the light generated and you have that photo multiplier tube, um, semiconductor uh, has a different way of interacting it. So when the X-ray hits it, so you'd be going in through detector, yep. and hits it, you get a direct readout. The event is um, immediate. Yeah, the good old photoelectric effect, right? right? So, so in, in silicon, like you said, semiconductor, loose electrons. Right. So you create a whole electron pair, and there's a whole bunch of like yep. uh, you know group theory that goes into it. Um, but and the energy or the amount, the electron energy is kind of pro directly proportional to proportional, the photon's energy. Right. So yep. it's, you know, an x ray goes in, you get a readout that is of a directly correlated energy off of it. Okay. Which means that you could do a lot of really in intriguing things from an engineering standpoint um, based on what kind of signal do you get out. Yep. So an x ray of a specific wavelength hits this, you get an electron hole pair of a specific, you know, distance there. And so uh, for the things like energy discrimination, what you're able to do is actually sort of like read things out, right? Like yeah. you can say, oh, um, I want to have this specific energy of events happening because I can correlate this to a specific energy of wavelengths, which is exactly what we want in a, in a diffraction experiment um, because we know the wavelength that's coming off of our tube. And that ties yeah. into Bragg's law and, you know. Lambda two sine so theta. I guess that's a good point to bring up this other concept that we hear a lot about, which is called charge sharing. And that limits exactly. the energy resolution of these detectors, right? Right. So maybe if we draw Here. kind of a side profile. I'll that. Sure, yep. I'll do it. Yeah. If we draw a side profile of the um, the signal coming in. So if we have a signal kind of coming in, right. uh, and we draw it like that, maybe. So these are the strips. These are kind of the bins looking straight down. Then when the x-ray comes in, if it comes in straight, bam, it's going to be counted just on this channel. But on the other hand, if the x-ray comes in at an angle, some of it is going to be shared between these. And when we look at the energy then as a function of count rate, so if this is energy on this axis, we're going to see that we get a little bit of a tail, and then it goes up and then down. And uh, these here, this is all coming from those charge shares. Right. So the charge sharing is basic. So we, if you think about an X-ray being a specific energy, specific wavelength, right? Um, ideally, it would hit right in the middle of one of these strips. Yep. Right. And so um, think about like a, you know, a bucket, like yep. or uh, you know that that stupid uh, carnival game where you're throwing, trying to throw That's a ball. Right, yeah. You're trying to throw yep. a ball in a bucket, right? And you would want that ball to go straight in. But like like all carnival games, it's usually it's usually not in your yeah. yeah so it'll, it'll bounce around. Yep. And so if you imagine taking your ball and hitting it like on the edge of two buckets, and then it splits into two smaller balls. Yep. You know, if you had yep. a ball of water, right? It yep. would go 
and then split. So what you end up getting is two events of half energy. Yep. And that's what all this charge sharing is. Yeah, it's, it's and it's more than just half, right? Because you can have any variation. Any from, variation. It could from be half. None of it, it could be 70, 30. Exactly. Yeah. So you get that tail. And, and in these detectors, what we'll do is we'll then put a threshold on it, kind of like this. Yes. To get the signal. And that ends up being about 1,000 EV ish. Yeah. So about 1,000 EV. That's enough to like start to get rid of iron fluorescence from the sample. Yeah. Uh, you're going to lose a little bit of your signal if you do that. But how can we make it better? That's the question, right? And how do we make it better? Well, we have an ASIC. That's right. <laughs> an, a an ASIC, so ASIC, which stands for? Application Specific <laughs> Integrated Circuit. And uh, so yeah. this is the back end. Yep. Right. So the back end is able to say, I know that if I have two events that happen at the same time, and they add up to one x-ray of a, you know, a predetermined energy, right? So say for copper, we know it's 1.54 angstroms, right? Specific energy. Um, then I know that that's likely to have been a real thing, but it's just split over over two strips. Yeah. Right. And all of a sudden now we get rid of the whole tail. Right. So what we do is a we nice sharp peak. We're able to draw in a nice sharp, sharp peak. peak. And that peak has a width of about about 380. 380 EV. So what does that mean in terms of practicality? Well. Where would K-beta be on this? Okay, so 380 EV. It's it's kind of a, a number that doesn't really mean a lot That's in terms right, of yeah. like the, the, so the practical watts. side. So, so what? So, so what? Right, yeah. Um, what is this? What is this? Metric? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So if this is your copper K alpha spectrum, we're going to assume copper radiation. It's it's probably the most common sure. wavelength yep. in a laboratory yep. system. K-beta would be right here. Okay? This is K-beta. I don't know if that, that yeah, orange is orange. Yeah, you can kind of see it. It's yeah, right here. See it. We'll, we'll go back with black. Okay. Off to the side. OK, this is K-beta. K-beta would show up right here. OK? And then all of your fluorescing events, so iron, cobalt, manganese, um, all of your first row transition metals, that which are in a lot of things, yep. right? Um, they show up down here. And so fluorescing, fluorescing events are happening from your sample. So it's not the x-ray that's coming off your tube. It's the x-ray off your tube, exciting your sample, and your sample basically glowing with x-rays. And so those glowing yeah. x-rays tend to give you a lot of extra background. So and the, I think we'll show it a little yeah. bit when we get so down to the So the benefit lab. here is no more analog nickel filters or yep. beta filters. Yep. That gives you a boost of signal. Yep. So high signal, eliminating that gives us yep. low background. Yep. And in the end, then, we have much better signal. Right. So like historically, yep. you know, those really, really old systems that were really, really slow, you had a lot of stuff in the way of the x-ray. You had nickel filters. And we'll show you that whenever we get down to lab here in yep. a little bit. Uh, but that would get rid of your k-beta. You would have things like secondary monochromators, which again is a physical thing that you're yep. putting in the way of your, of, your, of your detector. right? It's like having a really thick pair of sunglasses yep. and then trying to walk around in a dark room looking for like a very small amount of signal yeah. in your sample, right? Like yeah, you go to all the trouble to make the x-rays and you're throwing them away. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I mean, so you, like Nate said, I mean, you could do the nickel filter if you don't have fluorescing. If you do have fluorescing stuff, you switch over graphite monochromator, but still you're talking 50% loss. Yeah. You're talking 70 to 80% loss. Yeah. Now those losses are no longer present. So now we can measure in minutes. Yeah. Okay. So now that we've had a chalk talk, why, yeah. don't, why don't we go see it in action? Let's go see it in action. We're going to head on down to the lab. All right. See you there. So here we are in the XRD lab, and it looks like we have one of the benchtop machines. Yeah. So I'm surprised. So the um, energy discriminating detector fits in here? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is our DP basic. So this okay. is a benchtop speed spectrometer. Uh, little guy, right? You tell you don't need a computer. There's no chiller. This is plugged directly into the wall. But um, the XCT is actually our most popular detector. Uh, so it's it's capable of being equipped on a benchtop all the way up to our, our traditional D8 advanced systems. Okay, and earlier we said one of the benefits of having this energy discrimination is that you don't necessarily need those beta filters, which lower the signal, right? More signal, right. So this really then would be a great innovation for these bench stops. Yeah, because you know, you're know you running with lower power, so you don't have quite as many x-rays going through. Um, so you gain a lot of it back yeah. just by having a better a better detector. All right, so we're here to see it in action. Yep, yep. So uh, no tricks here. So yep. here is uh, corundum. So corundum. this is aluminum okay. oxide. Yep. 
So it's a centered uh, ceramic plate, you know, no spillage or anything like that. We like this because it is a, it's a nice, a nice diffracting sample. Okay. Um, behaves very, very well. And so we use this typically to measure um, instrument alignment and, and to verify the peak positions are where they need to be. So um, I don't have a beta filter in here right now. Okay. So we're going to run this with the full X-ray spectrum coming off the tube, and this includes the K beta as well. Okay. Right. So this would be like a standard strip detector that you might standard find strip out detector. there. Standard strip detector. So okay. I'm going to run this. Um, so this is corundum. Corundum, and we're going to do this with the full spectrum. So now with corundum, what we're expecting, we have aluminum, oxygen, and very nice structure. So we're expecting to see nice little background, very high peaks, sharp peaks. And that should yield a very, very nice K-beta peaks also yeah. if uh, you don't have any we're not, control. Yeah, we're not filtering it, right? it out. Yep. Right. So um, if we look at the scan as it comes in. So I've sat okay. this up for about a minute. Yep. So very, very fast data collection. Um, and a lot of this is enabled by the fact that we have those 192 strips in here. Okay. So effectively, this is 192 times faster than what you would see for assimilation time. Yeah. yeah. On older systems, you might have that Cinti with the 0.1 millimeter slit. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And the reason why we get that gain, and that gain is true, is because it's like having 192 of those stacked up next to each other, right? Bam, 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 okay. bam, right on top of each other. Now, so, do you take pictures and then you move it? Or no, this is a this is a scanning mode. So this okay, is so a, you scan it, and then yep. we're just binning all those counts. Exactly. All right. So the first peak we're looking for in corundum is at 25. So that would be Second right here. Second peak is at 35. Right. So we got all, all these extra peaks. So What's this that? is your beta. Okay. This is a beta peak for that one. This is a beta peak for that one. This is a beta peak for that one. All right. Yep. So now, how would we traditionally get rid of those peaks? With the K beta filter. So this looks like that. So it's like a piece of metal. Yeah, so this uh, this is marked with nickel. So you can right. call that as a nickel filter. Yep. So for copper, you would use nickel. For cobalt, you would use iron. It's it's usually one element backwards on the periodic table. All right, and but since it's like this big, thick metal, well, thick, it's, it's, it's a thin thick. foil, it's still going to take out some of our signal, right? It is. Okay. Um. So the easiest way for me to usually explain this is it is kind of like wearing a pair of sunglasses. Okay. Um, or more accurately, it'd be like wearing a pair of red sunglasses. Okay, so it takes out certain colors. Yeah, so preferentially is going to take out one wavelength over another. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to slide this in right in front of our detector. Okay. I'm going to run the same exact scan. So same scan, um, but now I'm going to be using the uh, so full, full X-ray spectrum, okay. right? Um, but I'm going to be using the, uh, the K-beta filter to reduce... Um, that uh, that signal, those those extra peaks. Okay. Data, right? Okay. So before we talk a little bit about uh, EV energies of the different wavelengths and things like that, so this is similar to having like a thousand EV or so. Right. 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 So um, we know that the K beta is going to be on the higher end. Right? Yep. So that peak right there at um, at twenty five is the peak that we're looking for. Okay. We're going to get rid of all that stuff below it. All those extra peaks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one thing I noticed right away is that the overall signal has dropped right. quite substantially. Right. Um, so what you're going to see is that uh, the K-beta filter, like we, like we just mentioned, yep. it's going to dampen all the beats. I mean, you're putting something in the way of the X-ray and the detector, right? Yeah. So what you effectively see is about a factor of two. Okay. Either about a factor of two, so 50% less intensity across the entire data collection. But because nickel preferentially will absorb K-beta versus K-alpha, it's about a factor of two for K-alpha. It is about a factor of 20 for K-beta. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So that's what we see. So that's gone now. Yep. These peaks over here are gone now. Um, but we will see a, a drop of intensity by about a factor of two. Okay. So, uh, yeah, and what I'm noticing is that, like you said, that drop in intensity, it does definitely cleans it up. But it does seem like the signal is a little more jostly, yeah. like the noise is a little bit worse. So this is, yeah. So this is one of the, the downsides of using the K-beta filter is yep. that you lose intensity. You lose okay. count. Um, so you either need to count longer um, to gain it back, or you take a hit in terms of things like your, your total sensitivity. Right? So we're going to do the same thing now, but I'm going to do it with the K-beta filter out okay. using only the detector to get rid of that K-beta. Okay, so so far we've ran the full spectrum, so we've seen everything K-beta and all. Then we've put the K-beta filter in, so the traditional K-beta filter, filter, filter. And now what we're going to do is with that out, we're going to go ahead and use the energy discriminating capabilities of this detector. Exactly. So we're going to do the same corundum scan, about a minute. 
and we're going to use the XET to do all of our filtering for us. Okay, and what this will do is this will give us back some of that intensity that we would have lost otherwise with that K beta filter. Okay. So we're looking for that first peak to be at that 25, the second peak at 35, and none of those other peaks exactly. in there. So if the detector is doing what we should be seeing, um, we'll get a gain of intensity, but we still won't see any of that beta. All right. So here we go. So first peak, 25, seems to be okay right now. Yeah. Next peak, we shouldn't see until we hit 35 again. Okay, and what I'm noticing too is that that oscillation seems to be a little more dampened, the uh, background. So yeah. the noise, the signal to noise seems to be much better now than exactly. it just was previously. And that's because you have more power. Okay. So now these detectors, this XTT, this, this has been around for a while, right? Yeah, so we've had the XTT out for um, you know, almost a decade now. Oh wow, so it's been, okay. It's been a while. So I've actually got this data already collected. All right. Same counting time, same minute long yep. span, same optics. Um, but I wanted to kind of show you uh, the overlay of what you could expect in terms of raw data versus um, using the detector or using the K-beta. Okay, detector. so we've zoomed in on that first part. Yep. So this is uh, the red scan is yep. going to be with that full full X-ray spectrum, right? Okay. We're not doing any filtering. Yep. We're not doing any stripping, right? Uh, so we see that K-beta peak right there. Yep. Right. The yep. black pattern that we see underneath here without that K-beta is with the nickel filter. So okay. it is working as intended. Yep. But what we see is that there's a pretty significant drop in intensity. Again, it's about yep. a factor of two. Yeah, yep, we see that on those peaks. And like you said, though, the K-beta is just completely wiped out. Totally gone. Okay. But I do take a hit in on terms of my, my actual yeah. intensity for so what So we'd really have to for. collect twice as long twice as to long. get the same quality of data. Exactly. All right. So if I turn on the scan for the XCT, what we should see here is, again, no K-beta. Yes. All that's gone. But what I'm looking at is a gain of about, you know, almost a factor two back. So, so we I'm, get it back. And this is, back that intensity. so is this some sort of like a algorithm that we're applying to the data or? No, no. so this is actually the data that you're collecting. So this is raw data. We are just intentionally saying, uh -huh. I only want copper K-alpha x-rays, not copper okay. K-beta. So using those innovations about the charge sharing, exactly. eliminating that, we're able to effectively get this kind of threshold. In. Yeah, so, you know, you can, of course, you could do post-processing of your data, you could do, you could do stripping, smoothing, background subtraction, whatever you yep. want, but the better way of looking at things is just to collect better data, and you yep. do that with the XCT detector. So, uh, the K-beta removal, check, that's what this is about, right? There's really no well, other advantage to using these? Actually, so, uh, there's the other end of the detector capabilities is okay. not removing K-beta, which in this case is a higher higher energy, but removing sample fluorescence. So I, I actually have a sample for that. Let's see if you can guess what that is. I hand you that. Well, let's see here. Uh, well, uh, as some may know, I am a material scientist with thin film background, so I would call this uh, cube light. I don't know. Um, gold. It, it, it looks like it, gold. That looks like gold to me. It looks like gold. That, that right. looks like gold. Yeah, yep. particularly that side right there. Yeah. Um, I don't know many scientists that carry around a chunk of gold this big in their pocket. Yeah, right? uh, I don't know. <laughs> Not, not that lucrative, right? But what this is is actually pyrite. Okay. Space gold. So I've actually space taken um, some of this, ground it yep. down, and made a nice thin, um, so we, we put this on top of a piece of glass so that I can touch it and not have to worry about it spilling yep. out. But we've taken the same, um, so this is pyrite, this is iron sulfide, yep. and we're going to analyze the sample um, to show you the other capabilities of the XCT detector. Um, so I'm going to go back and I'm gonna unload my coronum sample. Okay, so drop down. Okay. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna start out again in a traditional way, okay. right? With the K beta filter. So drop this back in. All right, so we're putting that metal filter back in. Yep. And we're gonna do this again with the full spectrum, but using the K beta filter because okay. we don't want to see those beta peaks. Okay. Um, we're gonna call this gold. And um, we're gonna do this with the K beta filter. All right. Now, this is a this is a real real world sample, yeah. right? And often naturally occurring samples or real world minerals something like that don't look quite as good as that as that synthetic coronavirus. So we're not going to see those sharp peaks and we might not see quite as good of a data. Okay. And this is 
this is normal, right? So anyone who's ever looked at um, sort of real world data knows that this is something that could happen. Okay. Wow. So the first thing I notice is that that background is we significantly, we yeah, we were down in the tens, the twenties. Yeah. Now it's 160 counts there. So you can see that things are diffracting. Yes. There is, there is some stuff going on yeah. in here. There's another peak right there. But a couple things to point out here. Higher background, yeah. more noise. But it, I, I tell you, Nate, it would be really hard for me to say that these were peaks Not or just noise. Count. Right. Yep. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I definitely couldn't make that call. And yeah. I do happen to know one fact. And that is, is that full of gold might have a lot of peaks, but gold has a very nice peak around 38. 38 degrees. So if we look at 38 here, yep, I guess we got fool's gold. You would say that there's, there's, there's gold. no gold in this here. Is this is gold, fool's right. gold. Yeah. Uh, so there we go. So what we're seeing here in this background right here yep. is actually sample x-rays. So like we talked about, sample fluorescence comes from the sample getting excited yep. from the x-ray tube. Okay. And rather than diffracting, which happens at very specific angles, you always get this sort of like background flooding. The elevated background. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, we talked about fluorescence before. We did an x-ray fluorescence episode. And exactly. Yep. And so, I mean, you know, same, same concept, right? So what we're hoping to see with the XCT is the ability to completely remove all of this. Okay. So I'm going to take that nickel filter out. We're going to use the full capabilities of the detector. Okay. So this previous scan, this would be like using a conventional strip detector with the conventional nickel filter. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to do it with an energy discriminating detector. Yep. So XCT, full capabilities on it. Gold. Now, what's really neat about this is so because we have such a tight energy window on our detector, we're able to get rid of, on the higher end, copper K-beta. On the lower end, we're going to get rid of all the sample fluorescence that's coming off of this iron material. Okay. Right? So for any sort of mining applications, yeah. corrosion products, or even just a chunk of fool's gold, right? Yeah. You expect to see that kind of elevated yeah. background. So this reminds me a lot, then, of... Um, Graphite monochromator. We used to use that ventilation counter, and yeah. it would get rid of the sample effects, yeah. but it would also get rid of that K-beta. Exactly. But, I mean, that, that technology is a little bit, it's a little bit dated. Yeah, the intensity would definitely take a take a dive. Right. And I know that they made a version of it for uh, strip detectors, but that was even more inefficient because well, of yeah, the geometry. Because you, you, you basically reduce the size of your detector back to a point detector. Yeah. So we're talking hours, hours yeah. of data collection with a graphite monochromator. Whereas with the energy discrimination on a strip detector, you get the best of both worlds. It's yeah. all of the energy resolution in terms of removing beta, removing sample progressions, but the size and the speed benefits of using a strip detector. So, I mean, I'm just looking at this. I am. You see more stuff. Yeah, I mean, I can see all of these peaks, and confidently, I can say that even in the the minute scan that we're doing, uh, and sure enough, right there. 38. There's a little bit of gold at the sample. I'm seeing that. I'm seeing yeah. a little peak right there at 38. Yeah. So it looks like not just all fool's gold, just but a also bit real of, gold. Well, huh? in the prepared samples. We added a little <laughs> bit of gold to these just to make them a little bit more fun. But if we do the overlay again, you can okay. see the same thing. Yeah. The raw data, yeah. one minute scans. Yeah. This is with the full energy spectrum. So all the sample fluorescence, all of that extra background, all that noise, same counting time, same sample. Yeah. But that dramatic reduction in background gives you all the sensitivity to these, these are extra corrosion products. So this yeah. is what happens when you grind a pyrite. It becomes other phases. And we're only able to really make that out confidently once you remove your background. And, and this isn't just like water falling or moving this scan this up. Is this data. is the raw data, this is the raw right? Data. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that is that is really amazing when we look at the signal to the peaks, like the signal to the background, significantly better here. Exactly. And even in these one minute scans, we can draw so much more conclusions about this sample. You have a lot more confidence when it comes to That's the right. peaks. That's right. So uh, thanks for demonstrating this. Yeah, so we course. saw not only the K-beta effect, but we also saw now the sample background effect. What we're gonna do is we're gonna head back up to the studio and we're gonna answer your questions that you sent in live. All right, see you there. All right, so here we are back in the studio. Yeah. 
So, yeah, that's a bit of a walk <laughs> this time. Um, so, if you have any questions, please make sure to uh, either type Type them in in. now, or if we don't get to them, then please send them to live.events at brooker.com. And uh, also remember to like, subscribe, and share. We'll be back with season two later this year. We'll be coming back with season two in in about a month or so, month or two. Uh, So make sure to throw out those likes and subscribes so that we can uh, can upgrade the stream a bit better. So the first question comes from Cromarty. And that is, would energy discrimination be useful in HRXRD measurements on single crystal 3.5s? So, for example, gallium intiminide, indium arsenide, indium arsenide stuff like that. Gallium arsenide yeah. would be another example. Okay, so it's so like we talked about at the beginning, right? Like there, there were two parts to energy discrimination, right? Like there's the getting rid of K-beta, yep. and then there's getting rid of sample x-rays, the sample fluorescence. And so for things like... Um, High-res XRD, so HR XRD. Um, typically, for these types of applications, you would have either a global mirror or a global mirror and a, and a primary monochrome. So primary side monochromators. We should we should point out that you know there are monochromators on the the tube side, there are monochromators on the detector side, and yep. we're talking about the primary side. Um, so what this is going to do is create a very very. So if you had a you know say a two ounce germanium monochromator, this would give you a very very pure straight beam. Generally, K-alpha-1, right, yep. coming straight off of your tube, um, off of the monochromator onto your sample. So that's already going to remove things like K-beta. Yep. It's going to remove K-alpha-2, right? So you end up with a very, very um, clean beam, very parallel. Um, but if you had something like sample fluorescence, um, like say you were working with uh, like superconductors and you had, so there, there were the really cool, yeah. like the bare- BFO. BFO, yeah. for example. Right. Well, it's like uh, iron in a superconductor. That's, what? Right. Yep. And yep. that would that would contribute to, to background. So the energy discrimination um, on the lower energy side for the sample fluorescence would absolutely help you out if you were dealing with that. For three fives, typically those don't fluoresce quite as much. Um, so for something like that, I would actually generally prefer something like the Iger two, yep. um, which I think we talked about last. Last episode? Yeah, we just came out with that new, it's a little bit smaller format, Iger 2R 250K. Right. So yeah. so new, new Igers, right? Um, so if you're, uh, so Cromarty, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about those detector technologies, which are very, very big, right, yep. for things like large reciprocal space mapping, um, extremely high dynamic range. So for things like you have a, a substrate peak that is just like, pow, like right through yep. the roof, and then you have like your, your tiny little film peaks. Um, check out our videos on demand from our previous live streams um, and uh, navigate to the one that says uh, Iger. Yeah. Iger. Yeah. yeah. So on that note, um, kind of to tie it into what we talked about earlier, um, we talked about an ASIC, application-specific integrated circuit. And the way it works is basically each of those counting nodes has a certain count rate. Um, in the case of the link size, you know, we can get up to hundreds of thousands of counts per second. But because the Iger has tiny pixels, 75 by 75 microns, and each of those has an ASIC backing it up. It's able to get that super high dynamic yeah, range. Yeah. Uh, in fact, you're able to hit uh, close to billions of counts per second. And that means just no need for absorbers. Yeah. And that dynamic range, that's going to be very beneficial it's for cool that. for XRR. It's cool for high res. You know, it's just it's a really, really, really neat thing for all of the uh, thin film applications. Yeah. Next question comes from Zachary. Why does the background signal on the fool's gold with K-beta filter increase over 2-theta? So the background. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you saw your up. background going up, right? Why, why so that it's not actually. So it's it's the scan with the K beta filter. It has nothing really to do with the K beta filter. It has to do with the sample fluorescence, right? So this is the uh, that lower energy of that that you know that yep. that energy tail that we saw. Um, this is uh, going to be from iron fluorescence. And the reason why your background goes up is it's actually it, it's kind of clever when you think about it. Um, is as your X rays go up, as you drive your X ray tube up to higher okay. angles, what you're doing is you're actually penetrating further into your sample. So it's like diving into a pool, right? The higher yep. up you go, the, the, the further into that pool you go. Um, for x-rays, as you go to higher angles, you penetrate further into your sample. So you actually access more sample fluorescence as you're going to higher angles. Okay. So that's why your background tends to go up. Yeah. There we go. So um, the benefit of things like energy discrimination is that you can pull all of that down regardless of your angle because you're saying that energy is not a copper X-ray. We that's know that right. that one's an iron one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And just to just to emphasize too, that measurement that's a that's a theta theta measurement. So 
So when we see the range was, what, 10 to 70? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually scanning the instant angle from 5 to 35. So exactly. it is actually fairly low yeah. to begin with, and then yeah. it's getting higher, like Nate had said. So, so looks like we had another question, question. From Ben Corey. Uh, there is a huge improvement in background using the XET in the example. How much of an improvement can be expected compared with adjusted energy settings in an original link size? Okay, so 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 Gen One link size, right? Yep. Um, the OG. The OG, right? So this this was my graduate work, right? Yep. And um, so there are still energy discrimination capabilities right. um, for any of our link size uh, family of detectors. Um, the XET takes it up another level because you've got all that extra. Um, get that rid extra, of the tail. Yeah, you get rid of the tail completely. But for things like iron, you can pretty well remove um, sample fluorescence. Cobalt a little bit, maybe not completely for yep. cobalt. Um, manganese, again, you get some, some improvement. And that's going to be because if you have the energy window, we know that above, well, I guess if we were drawing it this way, above your copper K-alpha is where your beta is. Like Below it is going to be where all your fluorescence is. And you can trim the lower energy threshold in just a little bit, and that will help you remove things like iron fluorescence. So we do see that for, um, you know, for various industries. Um, but yeah, for uh, so the the lower energy threshold on your original link side can be can be raised up. So if you have questions about that, um, definitely shoot them to us um, at the uh, the live events at and we can we can help you out yeah. with that. And one thing though to emphasize on that is that you do lose a little signal you do. on that OG. Yeah. And what that means is that you're going to want to have set it for discriminating setting when you're doing it. Yeah. And then you're going to want to open it back up when you're not. Yeah. And that's what you find on a lot of the uh, not specific energy discriminating detectors. Yeah. Whereas at XET, you just set it one way. Done. Just kind of yeah, set Never it, set it, it and forget it. Which that's is right. uh, the way that I like to you know, take your sample, stick it on, start the experiment, and you know. Yeah, you don't have to worry about the person before you, what they change the settings, stuff yeah. like that. Just works. Yeah. So uh, Rain, uh, Rainer, Rainer, yeah, Rainer, uh, is asking the question: Can the XET also be used with cobalt or other tubes? Uh, is it more efficient for copper or any other radiation? Okay, so yes, the XET can be used for any of our wavelengths, so from chrome all the way up to um, to silver. Yep. Um, different wavelengths, different hardnesses. Uh, it is really, really good, I would say. Uh, well, it's good for all of them, right? Um, as you get to the longer wavelengths, so things like chrome, um, it has to deal with how closely spaced your, co uh, your, your K alpha and your K beta are, yeah. right? Um, so they're not the same energy distance apart. I mean, this you know, yep. quantum mechanics, right? Yep. You know, the, you know, the, the characteristic distance uh, between a K alpha X-ray and a K beta X-ray changes depending on what element you're looking at. So for copper, moly, and silver, completely get rid of your K beta, right? Um, for cobalt and chrome, which are a little bit um, softer X-rays, longer wavelengths, um, that beta is a little bit closer. So you can remove. Um, Cobalt no. is pretty close. Cobalt I mean, is pretty close. Yeah, it's like going 90. From 1.5 angstrom to 1.7 right. angstroms. Right. So you can get, I would, I think it's like 90. It's over. I think it's yeah. like over 99 percent of the K beta yeah. gone just with the detector. Um, you might see a little bit of K beta, but typically we see this is only the case with things like Lab Six, um, with silicon powder. So anything that is a very, very strong diffractor, that's also high symmetry. Yep. So for most real world samples um, using cobalt, there's no K beta. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and on the other side, Molly and silver, you know, it works they're, they're way further apart, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're going to get really good background. That's going to be the benefit, and the signal is going to increase because yeah. you don't have to have that uh, zirconium for Molly. Zirconium, yeah. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the next question is from uh, CC Bala 43 uh, <laughs> Would the XET yield increased resolution for low-angle amorphous phase materials compared to a link side detector? Uh... I would say this isn't necessarily directly correlated. So low angle, low angle analysis is generally less about energy resolution and more about uh, physically matching the size of your sample. Um, I think I think we did a did we do a DBO? Yes, we did. Yeah, we did. So yeah, so go back to our videos on demand, and there is a um, a previous episode called DBO for dynamic beam optimization. And what this does is this talks about things like how to control the size of your footprint so that you're not spilling the beam over onto the sample holder, and it talks about um, this variable knife that we have, which can move very very close to your sample, and prevent you from getting any sort of air scatter. So um, 
the lynx eye detectors do have something to do with this because we have this um, this unique thing for detectors called a variable detector opening, which allows the um, the detector to open wider as you go to higher and higher angles. And so that can help you out with that low angle data. Um, it doesn't really have to do anything with the energy discrimination, but it is part of the engineering of the detector. So it's yeah. a it's yeah. a cool and feature. something on the new architecture. Yeah. Uh, that was started with XET, and now it's actually available on uh, through the LynxEye family. Yep. Uh, so not retrofittable though right. necessarily to the older ones, but the SSD 162, the Lynx i2. Yep. Yeah. On yep, the, they, yeah. they on all the phaser all the way up to the advanced. Now, um, what will help too though is that when you go to that low angle, you're going to generally close things down a lot, yeah. right? And so again, if you don't have the filter, yeah. the nickel, you get twice the signal. Exactly. Exactly. So that's going to help you out there. Yeah. So Brad is asking, we manufacture battery materials. What does energy discrimination do for our process? Depends on the battery material. <laughs> Depends <laughs> on the battery material, right? Um, but so one of the one of the cool hot topics are these so-called like NCM or NMC, depending on yeah. which nomenclature. So it's uh, nickel, manganese, and cobalt. Oh, that's a lot of fluorescing. <laughs> right yeah, there. if you remember when we were drawing that out, right? It's like all of the elements that fluoresce are that's all right. of the ones that yeah. you want to jam into these materials and these cathode materials. Um, but yeah, I, they are they're problematic elements. Right, they're, they're very problematic elements from a historical standpoint because like we saw with that pirate that you see your background go up, yep. right? Yep. Um, so yeah, absolutely. For battery materials, um, energy discrimination is really, really key to pulling your background down because if you think about a battery material, you want it to be very, very pure. Yep. And one of the, the things that we've seen before is that there are little bitty trace impurities that just sort of hide in that background noise. Yep. So if you had um, extra starting product or, you know, it's like lithium is super tricky to, to deal with. And so often you'll just dump as much lithium in there as possible. And you might end up with like side products, which can have a very significant effect on your, on your material properties. If you have, say, like a one or two percent impurity that you haven't accounted for, you know, that's one or two percent less power load because that's not the right material. Yeah. And another benefit, again, the speed, because if you're doing yeah. any sort of... Uh... What's the special? In, in operando. In operando. So, yeah. so it's like in situ, but yeah, for if you're, operating. If you're charge yeah. discharging, you can scan so much faster. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's a big thing. So that's uh, about it for the time. Again, if we didn't get to your question, please write those in to live.events at brooker.com. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for not only tuning in today, but for the whole season. And we look forward to seeing you in season two. So until then, make sure to keep your signal high and your background low. Bye, guys.